Welcome to a special interview. I'm your host, Vincent Franchini from Tumblr House, here with Robert Colhoun, uh, who is one of the directors of the pro-life organization 40 Days for Life. Uh, hi, Robert. Uh, thanks for coming on today. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks. It's great to be uh, on Tumblr House. And yeah, it's a privilege and honor to be here. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, tell us a little bit about 40 Days for Life. Uh, great. So my name is Robert Cahoon. I'm the international director of 40 Days for Life. Uh, I'm 37 years old, uh, married with four children, um, aged six and under. And uh, I've been working for 10 years for 40 Days for Life, uh, which is a Christian pro-life organization. Uh, and we help other Christians end abortion where they live. Uh, we particularly advocate um, encouraging Christians to pray and fast for an end to abortion. Now, I live in the United Kingdom. Um, I have done, uh, I've always lived in the UK, um, but uh, my job particularly has been to, to take uh, this particular pro-life mission and in particular, Four Days for Life in, in, involves encouraging Christians to pray outside abortion centres um, around the clock for a very intense period uh, of, of 40 days, um, twice a year. And uh, we, we've seen incredible results from this campaign. It's, it's been a real blessing. It's been a life-changing experience for me. Um, I started as a local leader back in 2010 uh, in, in London, United Kingdom. It's a very secular country, the UK, and we started organising prayer vigils outside of the abortion centres here. And we thought it would be a huge failure, but it, it's uh, been a huge blessing. And a lot of graces have happened. We've seen a lot of women who've chosen life as a result of, of being there in, in the most darkest hour. And uh, we've seen incredible graces happen. A friend of mine always compares working for the pro-life movement as having a pickaxe and kind of hacking against ice. And, you know, you're there hacking against the ice and you don't see any change for years and years. You know, and suddenly the whole sort of ice, uh, ice precipice collapses. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> out of nowhere, suddenly you've been hacking away on that ice for, you know, for a long time and then suddenly the whole thing you know, the cracks appear initially and then suddenly the whole thing collapses and you, you make a massive breakthrough. So uh, what's exciting about the UK is we, we are funding and paying for abortions in other countries around the world, uh, even where abortions are illegal in that country. And, and this is through taxpayers' money. Um, How is that Which possible? is kind of extraordinary. So basically what happens is um, the, the, the British government have pledged to give 0.7% of GDP to you know, developing nations for development, for international development, which is a very high number, um, part of the millennium, uh, millennial development goals. And so uh, they've got a huge budget in the um, Department for International Development, which is a, a government body. And they've pledged a very large amount to Mary Stokes, which is a large international abortion provider. Uh, they've pre pledged millions and millions of pounds towards one of the international abortion providers. Of course, when it comes to some of the African countries, uh, abortion is largely illegal in some of these countries. So the government gives money to Mary Stokes. Um, all that money is kind of in, in a sort of big fungible pot where, you know, the money just sort of counts towards everything towards Mary Stokes. It's not sort of given for a specific criteria. Um, so Mary Stokes will go to an African country and start paying for abortions, uh, you know, start providing abortions even where it's illegal in that country. And, you know, nobody bats an eyelid <laughs> over yeah. these issues. Yeah. So, I mean, this was happening in America. Trump introduced the Mexico City policy days into office and, and got rid of all the international funding of, of abortion. But, you know, it's fairly crazy that, you know, that as, through taxpayers' money, uh, we're paying for and exporting abortion abroad, even where it's illegal. It's, it's a pretty extreme policy, kind of, you know, akin to terrorism or, you know, to go to another country and break their laws is, is, is pretty bad. But, uh, right. You know, who's watching? Who's watching? <laughs> so seems to happen. Yeah. Wow. Um, okay. So uh, let's talk more about, like, the horror of, of abortion. What does abortion look like at the local level? I mean, how does it differ from the image portrayed in the media? So, you know, a lot of people have a conceptual mental understanding of abortion. or They have an idea of what it might be. And... The reality of what abortion is often differs from, but particularly those who are in favour of abortion, they have an idea, you know, maybe it's a choice, it's a, it's a difficult time for a woman, and, you know, this is a simple procedure, um, simple procedure that, you know, gets her out of a difficult situation, um, not, you know, it's like having a tooth out or a tumour out, you know, 
So this this is the conceptual understanding that I always, pro proportion. <laughs> I always say it's like the doctor waves his magic wand and poof, no baby. You know exactly, like, exactly. So. <laughs> So, yeah. so you know, a lot of people would think, you know, oh well, it's just a, you know these these wonderful euphemisms, all well in double speak. Uh, you know, this is a choice. This is a ba you know, this is a this is a choice, and you know, my body, my choice. All these slogans. Um, you know, the reality of what we've experienced on the local level in London. I mean, I'll just take you through some of the some of the you know some of the things that we've seen, um, it, which really blow that idea mental conception really out of the water so um the reality of abortion on the local level you know often it can be very ugly uh, it's it's very sad it's tragic um we've seen women um who have been in a in a crisis pregnancy who've literally been sort of coerced into abortions by their boyfriends or by their mothers um we've seen women who've been physically sick on, on leaving the abortion center alone and, and and afraid uh we've also seen the abortion providers um, behave in you know appalling ways um uh, around the abortion issue you know for example they haven't shown the women the ultrasound picture prior to the abortion because they know they won't have the abortion they'll separate the chaperone uh the, the boyfriend or whoever it might be from the woman as soon as they get in the building because they know they're more likely to to go ahead with an abortion at that particular time uh and you know particularly over 20 weeks um you know, abortion is legal up to 24 weeks in the UK, uh, up to birth on grounds of disability. Uh, but seeing late, um, you know, pregnant women walking, walk into an abortion centre is is a particularly troubling uh, experience. You know, you see somebody heavily pregnant uh, go go for abortion. It brings the issue all the all, all the more real. Now, now, I'm sure there are some women who, you know, say they don't have feelings, say it was a huge relief. Uh, many people say it was a big relief initially and then the enormity the enormity of the decision really hits them maybe a week or two later. And, you know, the, the mental health associations with abortions, which have largely been denied by many medical bodies, the association with suicide, with um, depression. Um, we saw one woman in London in Ealing and she was getting forced into abortion by her family and um, she really didn't want to go ahead with it and came to the second appointment and she jumped out of the window and jumped over three hedges. Oh, no. uh, on the way to escape from her family, the police came along. Oh, she, and she, 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 she's okay. She chose life. Yeah, she's okay. She chose life for her, oh, her unborn child. Gosh. But, uh, but yeah, no doubt, it's a traumatic experience for anybody. It's a crisis. It's a problem. Um, and you know, we really have to have compassion and understanding for anyone who's in a crisis pregnancy. Um, but you know, to terminate the child is is uh, is an act of violence that kills the life of an unborn child, whether it's at twelve weeks, whether it's twenty weeks, or um or, or later so it's an act of violence that ends the life of an unborn child and you know what with all that we know about ultrasound about images in the womb um you know a lot of people talk about babies in in, in the womb now but they just don't make that uh, co connection about what is really involved and i think the more transparency the more honesty we have in the abortion debate is a taboo abortion is a taboo subject in the uk yeah you can't grieve about it you can't talk about it you know, anyone at a dinner party, like, you know, woe betide, you start talking about abortion. Um, so, you know, we need to break open, you know, break open these grace-filled moments, encounters. And being on the streets, you know, people just come up to you and say, you know, I had an abortion 20 years ago and I haven't told anyone about it. So yeah. uh, these grace-filled opportunities to talk about it because, you know, they can't tell their parents, they can't tell their friends, they can't tell their partner, you know, they don't want to tell anyone. So we see that the, the tragedy with relationships that abortion has, um, and you know that it, it leads to a lot of relationship breakdown as well. And um, you know, I think we need we, we need a, a culture of honesty and truth in, in talking about it. And you know, breaking those cultural taboos of you know talking about it, just getting out in the open. That's why going and praying outside a centre is so countercultural. It's so exciting. And yeah. you know, it's part of a great mission. You know, we're a mission for life. And this is one of the biggest issues of our age. And you know, many Catholic. Um, causes are happy to support you know development in other countries but when it comes to you know ending the lives of children in our own country you know we we perhaps don't dedicate the time the the treasure talents and um time that we could do to this cause so um you know all, all the more getting out in public and, and hearing people's stories um meeting them where they're at and being that angel uh, we've had some people say you know i prayed for an angel you know to come along 
and and you were the angel who who was there when I was in a in a crisis moment and uh, yeah we hear great stories you know ninety ninety nine percent of people go ahead for the abortion anyway but you know a small number of people change their minds and those are the graceful stories that you know you've 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 literally saved a life not only life that child but life you know the woman perhaps avoided a lifetime of regrets uh, uh, impacted that family for for generations to come you can save one life like that that does incredible that person will be advocating for you in you know in heaven later on so uh, yeah have you ever heard great... of um I, I forgot where i heard this but i heard that abortion is a diabolic mockery of the crucifixion because it inverses things it's you know, at you know, uh, during the uh, consecration of the Eucharist, this is my body, which will be given up for you. Mm -hmm. Well, the yeah. abortion is actually the exact opposite. Your bo body, you will die for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's uh, right. Yeah, so that's to right. Me, um, to me, it's like it's like an actual like satanic uh, like mass almost. You know. Well. Um, basically, yeah. I mean, uh, we organised a really great prayer vigil in central London and Bedford Square for 3,000 hours and uh, abortion advocates would come out there, you know, abortion advocates cling to their own body that others may die. Uh, Jesus in the Eucharist says, you know, this is my body given for you. Yeah. And um, so, uh, yeah, you know, my body, my choice is the sort of slogan of pro-abortion advocates. Um, but Jesus gives of his own life that, that others may live. And, you know, when the abortion centre closed in central London, we, we had permission to say the mass, the Eucharist, inside the building that the day after it closed. And to hear the words in the Eucharist, this is my body given for you. Mm. It's, it's the exact opposite of, you know, abortion advocates who, who um, you know, who will say, you know, this is my body, my choice that, um, you know, that, yeah, it, in a way it's an, inver it's an inversion of, it's inversion of God's plan for love and God, God's plan um, for life. Um, you know, I heard recently that, you know, pornography is the perversion of sexuality and uh, surrogacy is the perversion of, of reproduction. I mean, I, I would have thought that surrogacy is, is you know, a far greater sin because it involves the, uh, you know, involves manipulating potentially somebody else's life and stealing mm -hmm. the child off a of a, you know, another person. Um, I'm sure, you know, pornography is still a very grave, extremely grave sin as well, but it doesn't involve a lifelong sort of manipulation of, of another person in the same degree or to take a child off a, off a mother in, in such extreme circumstances. But yeah, there's certainly a real diabolical aspect of, you know, abortion. Uh, you look at you know, Margaret Sanger, the evil of Planned Parenthood, oh, yeah. the, uh, what, what, what they what they've have, have done and you know, uh, trading baby body parts. I mean, this is sort of evil, kind of un unimaginable. Uh, and and racist too. And racist. That's right. There are websites, blackgenocide.org. Yeah. You know, there there are, yeah. are minority communities who are aware of what's happening. Um, That's right. There's the racist origins of, of Planned Parenthood. Uh, certainly, the founder of Mary Stapes International, uh, Mary Stapes, the person uh, had a you know deep eugenic. Uh, she's part of the eugenic society. Um, you know, had a sort of racist tinge to racist tinge to her as well. Planned Parenthood will deliberately target poor minority yeah. neighborhoods, often you know black or Hispanic neighborhoods, deliberately to, to target target the poor. So if you look at Martha Twenty One, it goes into the you know racist roots of, of Margaret Sanger and uh, you know giving speeches to the Ku Klux Klan, and you can yeah. you couldn't make it up, you know. So uh, yeah, uh, quite crazy, yeah. Going back to you know the this is my body ridiculous argument one of one of my favorite um, you know innovations of the pro life movement one of my favorite slogans is um, abor abortion stops a heartbeat because that's so potent that in a single line it's true abortion stops a heartbeat whose heartbeat you know if it was mm -hmm. your body then you're dead but it's yeah. not your body. You know, so exactly, I, yeah, and it touches the emotion too. Like it gets it emotional in that in the single potent line. I, uh, I really think that's effective. Yeah, if, if we had windows, there'd be no abortions, and the heart starts beating at like twenty-one days. And yeah, uh, yeah, the the more that you can personalize this issue um, to help you know people understand that you know we're talking about human person here, and you know abortion depersonalizes. Uh, the unborn child and you know a person's a person no matter how small 
it doesn't matter the size level of development uh, environment or level of dependency that you know you're, you're talking about uh, uh, killing an unborn child and, and that's the heart of the matter and you know sure some people who don't share christian values or never really thought about it maybe it's, it's not such a particular issue to them but you know even the slogan like abortion stops a beating heart like that gets people to think and a lot of people just haven't really thought about this i mean even up us being at university i'd never you know i wrote at one one article when i was a teenager at school on this topic but i'd never really thought deeply about it but yeah. you know the more we can touch people emotionally personally spiritually uh mentally on the topic you know awake a growing consciousness to the humanity of the unborn child um get them to you know imagine understand we can't see the unborn child but we can imagine we can see through ultrasounds you know technology's never been greater in terms of showing the reality of the unborn child and, and the more we can bring that to life in, in people's lives and it helps to bring the enormity of what's involved yeah so let's get into the actionables and drawing people from apathy um and mm -hmm. i get i'm i'm one of these people too where you don't realize the horrors of a uh, of abortion you like it's not real it's just numbers you know mm -hmm. but um one thing hit me in this past year uh, just thinking about this, you know, I, I and I thought, you know, you think about the Holocaust, right? And the Germans who just silently stood by while this is happening, and you wonder about their culpability, right? But mm. then, but then you apply that sort of scenario to us, and then you ask, how culpable are we when we die? Is God going to be? Is God going to say to us, why didn't you do anything? Because to me, we are in. A better position than those Germans to do anything. So we're actually mm -hmm. more culpable. Is that not so? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you bring up lots of really good points there. And you know, Edmund Burke says, you know, all that ha uh, all that's needed for evil to flourish is for good people to mm. do nothing. And there are certainly comparables with the Holocaust. Um, you know, the Holocaust. We're talking about a lot of Jewish people who died in concentration camps. Millions of people died in concentration camps. Uh, abortion is a different topic. Uh, it involves the murder of unborn children, and unborn children are being murdered in, you know, in our own communities. Um, and this is a silent hol holocaust that unborn children can't communicate easily themselves. They cannot, you know, speak for themselves necessarily. Um, but we are called to be their brothers and sisters, and you know, to speak up, uh, be a voice for the voiceless, rescue those being led to the slaughter, as it says in the proverbs. Um, you know, and to to stand up for injustice and you know this that we have nearly 50 million abortions every single year around the world um and absolutely you no know, if, if we know tangibly what's going on and we do nothing uh, you know the, the onus on is on us to to actually be active and you know tangibly do something about it and, and that's really where four says for life has, has come in that the spiritual realm understanding the power of prayer the power of fasting uh, these are strong spiritual tools um which as Christians, you know, we, we don't obviously associate with abortion quickly and easily, but however, they are very powerful. And, you know, when we pray, when we petition God uh, strongly, when holy and just people do that, uh, then you're going to see things happen. And, you know, we've seen countless abortion centers close, hundreds of thousands of lives be, uh, thousands of lives be impacted. Uh, a lot of lives been saved. Uh, people quit their jobs. Um, Christians get, you know, passionate, involved in the pro-life movement for, for the first time. So, yeah, the onus is on us. And for me, what's really touching about this topic is, you know, as Christians, like, you know, if you're a doctor, if you're like a surgeon, you can like save people lives in your job, but maybe not on a daily basis, like maybe like once a month or once every few months, you might save a life as a surgeon, as a doctor. Um, but if you're a Christian, and you're a pro-life activist, you're a pavement counsellor every day, uh, you can save a life uh, with what you do uh, like every single day. And, yeah. you know, we've had pavement counsellors, uh, sidewalk counsellors in the UK. I mean, they've saved hundreds of lives. People very good at it, dedicated, committed, paid in, in a full time job doing it. And, you know, reaching out to people at the last moment and they've saved hundreds of lives. So, so this is a ministry that involves literally saving lives. And, you know, the, the sky's the limit, you know, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've seen some pretty remarkable pro-lifers around the world um, who, you know, started a pro-life initiative and they've saved, you know, thousands and thousands of lives, you know. So, wow, you know, everything's up for grabs. So, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, a, it's an exciting ministry 
exciting ministry uh, to be part of. And yeah, it's it's if anything, it's worth you know more people have died from abortion than all human you know wars combined in human history. Like this is the enormity of abortion. It, it seems invisible to you know secular society, but this is a huge issue and you know a, a grave injustice. And you know God calls us to do something tangible and particular about it to get out there and go and make a difference. Let's talk about how people become more fervent and more active in the pro-life uh, movement. Now, mm -hmm. uh, I in in one of the local churches, I they have one of these nice pamphlets, and it says like top ten reasons people convert to the Catholic faith. And in that pamphlet, what's interesting is the number one reason people convert to the Catholic faith is they want the Eucharist, which mm -hmm. I thought was interesting. Like, okay, so that's the thing. So, is there any trend or tendency? Um, in terms of, you know, w what idea, what clicks in someone's head and says, okay, this is actually going to motivate me to action and I'm going to get more involved now. Is there anything uh, that might not have an answer, but I was just curious. Well, um, interestingly, in the United States, 30% um, of our leaders are post-abortive women. So people who've, who've uh. personally been impacted, um, who have a change of heart, you know, the, the pro-life movement is a movement of converts. We have a lot of people who, you know, haven't always been pro-life, but have had a change of heart, change of mind. We've got two full-time abortion, uh, former abortionists on our staff now, which is an incredible story. Mm. You know, used to provide abortions, now work for the pro-life movement. That's that's pretty, pretty remarkable. And uh, some people see images, and images are the thing that that changes their heart, changes their mind. Yeah. Um, you know, things are really powerful and tangible when people have a, a strong personal emotional connection with the issue maybe they've um had uh, a personal connection with abortion or, or um boyfriend or a girlfriend you know some close relative who's who's who've been involved in the issue or you know they were nearly aborted themselves that some of these people are the, the strongest pro-life advocates out there because the issue is personal it's not an abstract uh, abstract political ideal it, it's something de deeply personal um, but you don't need to be, sort of have that personal connection, you know, to, to be pro-life or to be a pro-life activist. Um, but, you know, when these when we bring these stories to life, and, and I think yeah, Abby Johnson's film on plan does that remarkably well of, of how abortion impacts somebody's life. And we make the emotional connections and spiritual understanding. And, you know, God doesn't want people to stand still. You know, if they're in a crisis pregnancy, um, he wants, you know, them to know his love and the options and you know the the hope that comes with choosing life for an unborn child somebody's had an abortion forgiveness healing reconciliation you know god wants those people to sort of come to him and and you know have a change of heart change of mind afterwards and so yeah everybody's in a different position and everyone's in a different position and people come to be pro-life for a whole range of different reasons but you know it's a it's a standard christian uh, standard Christian belief, but um, you know there are secular pro-lifers as well. There's, yeah. there's vegan pro-lifers. There's uh, people from from all from all all, all, all walks of life. You know, so yeah. <laughs> Ve vegan pro-life too. You know, so uh, uh, that's they're, they're vegetarian and pro-life. We'll take yeah, it. They're not, we'll against, take they're it. not against sausages or something. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or burgers, you know. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. Um... Okay, so um, what can someone who, who is passionately pro-life do uh, to, to help end abortion where they live? Yes, yeah, so um, we had a teacher that came along to our prayer vigil one time and he prayed for an hour at the abortion center and he asked, you know, Lord, you know, how, what can I do to end abortion? And of course, he, he was a teacher at the school, so he prayed for an hour. He went back to his school and he helped hundreds of people choose life for their unborn child. Sorry, no, he, he taught that to hundreds of students a pro-life message, which was a powerful, wonderful thing to do. Um, we had another person who came to the prayer vigil and the abortion waste truck arrived and this was his first hour coming and, you know, kind of broke his heart as he sort of saw and kind of made the connection and understood what was going on. Um, so uh, it's certainly the, the front line, are you going to pray a, a prayer vigil, going to see abortion, you know, in the local community where you are, it, it, this is like a first step, encouraging people to go and pray. You'll never forget like first time going to it's going outside people's comfort zone 
yeah. to go and pray outside an abortion center. It's a controversial topic. Most people, it's like, oh, I'm afraid. I don't know what's going to happen. Should, be, should you people know? be afraid? Because I think that's a deterrent. That's I true. think uh, then, uh, overcoming fear is, is a crucial thing. Yeah. But, you know, it's a natural sort of first reaction of something you haven't done before. Uh, you're not sure what, what will happen. Uh, you've never been there before. Some people are afraid. Some people are not. Um, so, you know, it says in the Bible, you know, nearly 365 times, do not be afraid. And, yeah, we need to have courage. We need to have confidence. Uh, and we need to have, you know, a, a real strong sense of, uh, you know, our, our Christian beliefs and how they can impact society. So, you know, for somebody who's passionately pro-life, there's so much that you can do, you know, whether if you've got a full-time job, um, you know, we've just got a book out uh, to the heart of the matter with 40 Days for Life. And this is this is simple, actionable items that you can take every day, mm. you know, for, for a 40 day period, just do one little thing every day. And, you know, cumulatively, those things will add up over time. And, you know, the, the local prayer vigils we have are absolutely fantastic. We've got over 500 cities around the world who organize a local local prayer campaign. And it's a brilliant campaign to be involved in. And praying on the local level um, is really powerful and important because it, it's a sign to the local community that what's happening there is, is wrong, that there's an alternative, uh, that you're, you're hands and feet of Christ outside the abortion centers um, to show that there is a love in the community can help somebody choose life for their unborn child. And, you know, we're, we're there to be a sign of God's mercy, a sign of God's love, um, not there out of judgment or intimidation. Um, if you want to get involved, there are three parts of the pro-life movement, the political, the prophetic and the pastoral. So there's crisis pregnancy centres. You can go volunteer there. You can get involved in a political campaign. Um, maybe you're, you, if you're talented in like media skills, there's there's those actions. Uh or if you've got time for volunteering, or maybe you feel called to do something full time. So just going and getting involved, you know, go and volunteer for a few hours and, you know, try and do that on a weekly basis for, for a certain period of time and then take things from there. But pray to God and ask him to show you, you know, how he wants you to impact on the local level. And, you know, a lot of our local volunteers said, you know, when, when we've seen a woman's life transform change, she chose life who otherwise was going for an abortion, that made this issue all the more real, you know, rather than just being this abstract idea of, abortions out there it's kind of going on somewhere else we don't know about it uh it, this is this is a live direct you know clear example of somebody's life being transformed so the more that you can have you know those grace filled encounters and i've held the babies that you know were scheduled to be aborted that were seconds away from from being aborted and holding those babies in our arms and thinking you know wow if it wasn't for our work for the grace uh, you know god's grace the the courage of the mum and you know some fortuitous circumstances you know, this child would not be alive today and was, was seconds away from being aborted. So wow. those, kind of, those kind of emotional connections you know, are pretty powerful. And, and if you have one of those as a pro-lifer, uh, you're going to get hooked on this work. And, what, 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 does hooked on this work. what does that mean seconds away? Like what happened in, in that instance? So, so well, for, um, for, well this, this woman was going for a second abortion appointment. So if she goes and has the second, you know, the, the second pill, sometimes you have a first pill and a second pill. Somebody going for the second abortion appointment, uh, the first one might have just been checking in with the abortion provider and then going for the first pill on the second appointment, um, or, or it might be going for the second pill on, on the third appointment. But, oh, you know, okay. so somebody just going for that, you know, that, that pill, it, it's a kind of irreversible decision after, after the second pill. Um, so big seconds away, you, you're standing at the door, they go through the door, they have the pill, they're taking uh, the pill, the abortions happened. I so see. you're you're literally seconds away and you're offering a leaflet outside and saying, you know, this is the last chance you have of, of choosing life. And, you know, for many people that's very emotional. It's a difficult circumstance uh, to be in. It's it's the last sign of hope. And so the people that have accepted, you know, life at that very last moment, uh, there was a story in the United States of a woman who, uh, you know, she, she had her shoes off and she had her feet in the stirrups, you know, stirrups out wide, just about to on the abortion table, and, and she ran out of the abortion centre without her shoes on, you know, like, yeah. from from having her feet up in the stirrups to running out. And we we had another story of a woman who held the abortion pill in her hand, and the nurse misdiagnosed her blood results, uh, thought she had the wrong blood, had a blood problem. She said, "Don't go ahead with the abortion." She walked out. She gave the testimony with her toddler at one of our launch events. Previously, so she had the abortion pill in her hand. She took that, took that pill. You know, baby, no more. Um, but thanks be to God, thereby the grace of God go I. Uh, that child's 
alive today. So we're, we're talking about seconds. This is life and death. Yeah. You know, this is this is the frontier between life and death. We're on the front row of a culture war, and um, yeah, we see some pretty ugly, uh, see some pretty you know pretty ugly things that have happened um, outside. Ambulances arrive. Uh, we've seen you know women die in abortion centres. Um, we've seen some pretty ugly things happen. So you know it's it's uh, the front line between life and death. Um, okay, um, so, another question, so 40 days for life, so what's the timeline for that look like in terms of the actual, is that, is that, that makes me think of Lent when you say That's right, um, so 40 days for life is a locally organized community initiative, and it happens twice a year in Lent and in the autumn, um, people apply in June, June and December, and, you know, to organize a campaign, uh, there are three parts, prayer and fasting, a peaceful vigil for 12 hours a day for a 40 day time period so you organize a community to wow. pray outside the abortion center for like 500 hours solid and th this is why we've seen over 16,000 uh babies saved from abortion from having a you know all or nothing model just give it everything you've got and pray there forever <laughs> until wow. there is no more so so for most people i think you know we're never going to fill all those hours 12 hours a day consecutively for for 40 days solid um but by, by setting a standard really sky high, you know, if we said, oh, yeah, just come on a Saturday morning for an hour, you know, yeah, right. we, w we wouldn't have a movement. And, uh, you know, a lot of our leaders are, are super passionate. You know, they, they know the enormity of what's involved with this. And they know, you know, they know we, we've seen a thousand women in the UK who are scheduled for an abortion, who've chosen life, uh, thanks be to Wall Days for Life, outside the abortion centres and 10 years of ministry. So, so this is the impact that we can have. You know, if we weren't there, they'd probably gone ahead with the abortions. So... You know, it, this is the impact that we know we can have. And, you know, first campaign I did, we saw six babies saved from abortion. That was just in one 40-day time period. So, uh, and then community outreach, taking a positive message to the whole community um, through, you know, positive, upbeat message um, to schools, universities, media, cinemas, um, debates, uh, media, door-to-door, uh, -door, you name it. You know, just getting a pro-life message out there in, in, in the community. It's, it's a really powerful way to, you know, to communicate a pro-life message. So... Um, yeah, simple campaign it can be implemented anywhere, and yeah, it, it, it's very exciting. And, and you know, this is a hard ministry. It's it's not for the faint-hearted, and there's a lot of spiritual, you know, challenges, attacks. Uh, you're outside one of the most challenging places in our society, and a lot of people have got very strong ideas on this. They they will either love you or hate you, <laughs> and uh, yeah. this uh, um, you 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 have some significant, you know. Um, significant response from from the public in in attempting to do such a ministry but it, it's extremely life-giving we've seen people get married among the volunteers who've met among the among the groups and um yeah it's it's been been life-giving uh, i've traveled to different countries like croatia six years ago they now have every single city where abortion happens legally they have a prayer vigil there uh, but 37 prayer vigils around the country there and they've seen over 100, uh, 100 women choose life for their unborn children as a result of their efforts. So it uh, shows, just shows what can be done in, in Colombia as well. We have a very strong presence, 45 um, prayer vigils around the country. They, they have a baby shower once a year and about 25 mums who chose life in the previous year come to the baby shower. They give them gifts, um, gifts. They give them uh, sort of, you know, um, nappies support and they have a big party and, and celebration it's, it's a really powerful experience all these mums were going for an abortion in the abortion center they've been helped by the local pro-life groups so um yeah this this is what's at stake uh, this is what's at stake and um, yeah it, it's a great model this is a great starting point for anybody you know a lot of people this is the first thing they ever did you know the pro-life side and yeah we're going strong we've got 13 prayer vigils in the uk for this lent now so coming up yeah. so um you know we keep growing we've grown three times over in the last 10 years, if we did the same again, we'd be in, in many, many more places in five, 10 years time. So that's what I hope that we'll be, uh, that's where I hope we're gonna be in the next five, 10 years. Um, okay, and just for my part to to help encourage people to go to prayer vigils and to pray in groups, um, in the secret of the rosary, uh, St. Louis de Montfort, the great Marian saint, he said that when you pray in a group, uh, the rosary, like let's say you play with 30 people, your rosary is literally 30 times more efficacious. And on top of that, because, you know, everybody um, has very, um, some people are saying the rosary well, some people saying not so well. 
Well, he used a metaphor for that. He says, because the devil's going to try to distract you, when you pray in a group, it's like trying to break a bundle of sticks compared to breaking a single st stick. So all the, the rosaries merit according to whoever's saying it the best. So that, to me, that knowledge motivates me to go to prayer vigils and to, you know, rosaries like that because your prayer is so much more efficacious when you do it in public compared to, I mean, they're good at home too. Don't get me wrong. If you can't go to these, that's good. But at prayer vigils, oh, really good. Yeah, I mean, the rosary is a powerful tool. We're an ecumenical campaign and we've got, you know, Christians from all denominations. This uh, abortion is an issue that unites all, all different types of Christians, but a lot of people do pray the rosary at our prayer vigils, and it is really, really powerful. And we've seen, you know, we've seen the power of the rosary. And you're right, people coming together, praying together, rather than being on their own, or, you know, actually praying together, unity of that prayer. We don't know how God uses that prayer, but, you know, what's for sure, it's, it's extremely powerful. John Paul II said, you know, prayer and fasting constitute the most powerful force in in human history and this is a spiritual battle between good and evil life and death yeah. and we're on the front line here and you know we're, one of our local politicians said that we were weaponizing rosaries who is a strong <laughs> pro-abortion pro uh, advocate and i you know, just sort of found that sort of you know mildly amusing so that, was, that, that was an she, opponent uh, that was an opponent uh, th of... this was a pro-abortion person saying that yeah pro-abortion pro uh, member of parliament said that we were weaponizing rosaries that uh you know so she kind of knew that sort of uh, well that you know that's, that's uh, ironic it was a kind of that mirrors well, padre right, yeah. pio because padre pio well, said right. the rosary is the weapon <laughs> exactly yeah so it's a very strong it's a very you know it's a very strong uh a very strong prayer and you know wow it, it, it is really really powerful and yeah we you know we, yeah, we don't know how God uses these prayers, but but, but for sure, yeah, it, it definitely works. So, yeah, we should be very encouraged. Okay, so um, to close to close us out, where can people find out more about the pro-life movement and 40 Days for Life? Sure. Well, if, there, if you're interested in finding out more information, go to 40daysforlife.com. That is uh, our main website. And, you know, from that, we've also got a podcast. Uh, we've got a magazine um, where we have merchandise. We have... Uh, we have a number of books in the ministry. We've got the film Unplanned that came out last year, um, which largely features 40 Days for Life and doing more and more documentaries over time. We've got a YouTube channel as well. So, so go to the main website if you're interested in finding out more about the pro-life movement. Um, some of Randy Alcorn's books, um, you know, uh, pro-life answers to pro-choice questions and why pro-life are some ex excellent introductory, uh, introductory books to the pro-life movement. Yeah, you think of someone like Bernard Nathanson's The Silent Scream um, or even Abby Johnson's book Unplanned or Bernard Nathanson's The Hand of God. These are great introductory books to, to get you involved in the pro-life movement. So, you know, there's a lot of different pro-life groups out there, but, you know, just, just start somewhere and start somewhere and, you know, go along to a prayer vigil. Uh, the, be the best thing is to get out there and go and do something, go to an event, uh, go to a March for Life like Washington, D.C. or many of the local state ones, uh, just get out there and go and, go and do one particular thing. Uh, and then from that, you know, uh, pray to God and ask how he is, uh, what he is asking of you to, to go and make a difference. You might be pleasantly surprised, even just being a volunteer, literally you can save a life, literally you can impact the lives of others in your community. Uh, you can wake up to the enormity of the crisis about abortion and what you tangibly can do as a response to that crisis. So yeah, it's, it's an exciting, a lot to play for in the pro-life movement at the moment, you know, who knows, we might see Roe versus Wade overturned sometime in the next five years. Trump comes in for another four years, you know, more supreme, uh, more just pro-life justice on the Supreme Court. Who knows well, what's going to happen in the next few your years. You're so about Trump coming <laughs> in again? It's going to be interesting. Yeah, well, well, we'll see. We'll see. You know, I'm, I'm no, I agree. Here to be I, I agree. political no. commentator in America, but but look, everything's up for grabs. It might not happen. It might happen. I'm, I'm not, not going either way. I'm just saying these things are, are possible. No, and, it's, it's, you know, we're, we're up to, for some exciting times in the pro-life movement. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, Trump's going to definitely be the president again. But um, the one thing that I saw on, on the website uh, that was interesting is the map of demonstrations or the, uh, yeah. people, uh, or the Planned Parenthood. Because I noticed you guys touch all the ones that are near my local community. Like there's a Planned Parenthood right by my El Pollo Loco. I always see the demonstrators whenever I'm going – in that area and always you know supporting them so uh i think that's that that would probably be a good way to get involved look what's going on near people in the map and and reach out to those people 
That's right. Yeah, we've got a map showing where all the provincials are. So find the one that's closest to where you live uh, and go and join them, you know, and just go along once and, and, and take things from there. So, you know, this is what helping Christians end abortion where they live. The abortion is something that happens in the local community. And when the local community galvanizes, gets together, organizes campaigns, uh, this is where we see changes. And, you know, say if Roe versus Wade goes, it's going to be a great time for Four Days for Life because we're the ones who have uh, on the local state, you know, all the local groups, uh, on the local state and if abortion becomes a local state issue then you know all, all that emphasis goes right back to the local yeah. state which is which is fantastic news for us and you know puts us once again even more at the forefront of the front line you know in the cultural world and, and things have never been worse for Planned Parenthood you know 10 years ago they were invincible you know they were like a you know untouchable politically uh, media wise um, but now the things are, you know, beginning to turn and, yeah. you know, they're, they're friends in politics, media and, uh, you know, all the liberal lefties are, are you know, jumping on new bandwagon causes. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> theirs, theirs is an old cause and they are old news. Um, so yeah. they are not finding the support that they once had. And, you know, that's why things are, are very much more up, up for grabs. And that's why we could see, you know, more and more change over time but i think you know the local narrative when people really understand exactly what abortion is uh, what it entails uh, the damage hurt the lies the misinformation the evil that it involves uh, and when we shine light into the darkness uh, the darkness will not overcome that light mm -hmm. and that's what this ministry movement's all about uh, and you can be a local participant you can participate in in god's will in, in ending abortion right where you live so, so get out there go and join a, a local vigil and yeah, be open to the Holy Spirit, uh, moving and changing life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Gosh, it's been such an honor to have you uh, on the show, Robert. Thank you so much, um, and God bless you. And forty days for life. Uh, no, no problem at all. Yeah. Yeah, no problem at all. Well, thank you so much indeed, and keep up the great work at, at Tumblr House, and mm -hmm. uh, long may you get many more uh, subscribers and viewers on your channel. And uh, thank you so much indeed for uh, having me on today. All right. Take care. Cool. Thanks so much indeed. Mm -hmm.